Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the formation of the placenta, the fetal membranes, and the umbilical cord, and the function each of these play in pregnancy and fetal development. Specifically, we're going to look at implantation and HCG release, placental formation and function, the fetal membranes, and the umbilical cord and its anatomy and physiology. Timestamps are available for each of these, and you can find that in the description if you'd like to go to each of those individual parts. So in this case, we've had implantation and fertilization occurring, and now we have our chorion forming as well as some of our placenta. So we look at these kind of finger-like projections coming off the chorion. Those are our syncytiotrophoblasts, and they're the differentiated trophoblasts that are actually going to help form placental blood supply as well as hormone release. We also have the forming placenta, and this is just showing us that the purple area here is the mother's blood supply. Importantly, you'll note that the syncytiotrophoblasts and the maternal blood supply is not meeting, and that's kind of one of the core principles of the placenta. In terms of hormone production, if we have our ovary come here, the syncytiotrophoblasts are going to release HCG, which is going to specifically interact with the corpus luteum in the ovary. So HCG released from the syncytiotrophoblasts is going to aid in keeping the corpus luteum alive so it can continue to do its job. So it's going to stimulate the corpus luteum to stay alive, and it's going to release the hormones we know it's good at releasing. So things like estrogens, which is going to help increase the size of the endometrium, progesterone, which is going to help with some milk supply, while also increasing the size and engorgement of the endometrium. We're going to have relaxin, which is going to help relax the pelvis, and then we're going to have inhibin, which is going to prevent things like uh, contractions from occurring during the development of the fetus. Because of rising HCG levels in early pregnancy in order to keep the corpus luteum alive, it's these levels that are used in pregnancy tests to determine pregnancy. Around month four, we swap out that developing fetus for this fully developed placenta. So it takes about three to four months for the placenta to fully develop, and that's going to allow for the placenta to perform its typical functions for the fetus, and it also takes over hormone secretion. We'll break off a little piece of the placenta here so we can take a closer look at the hormones that are going to be released. So as the syncytiotrophoblasts form, their first job is going to be to release human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG. And the release of this HCG is going to allow those syncytiotrophoblasts to rescue the corpus luteum. So the job in the first four months as the chorion is formed and the syncytiotrophoblast is formed is to make sure that corpus luteum stays alive until the placenta fully forms. So syncytiotrophoblasts are going to release that human chorionic gonadotropin, which is going to allow the corpus luteum to stay alive. And we know the corpus luteum is going to secrete things like progesterone and estrogen. And those are the two main hormones that are going to be released in order to allow the endometrium to be further engorged or to grow to support the fetus. So progesterone and estrogen are going to allow for sustainment of the uh, endometrium. So we build the endometrium and we engorge it with blood in order to support that fetus. And the other thing that progesterone and estrogen are going to do are prepare the mammary glands for lactation. So they're going to help the body get ready for milk production for when the fetus is born. So what we'll do now is we'll slide this large arrow in to indicate that the placenta is taking over at the three to four month mark in secretion of progesterone and estrogen. So as we mentioned, in the first three to four months, the corpus luteum is rescued and it's going to release those hormones. But around month three to four, the placenta is fully formed and those syncytiotrophoblasts can take over secretion of progesterone and estrogen. We're also going to talk about relaxin. So we know, again, in those first three to four months, the corpus luteum is releasing relaxin in response to those HCG levels that are keeping the corpus luteum alive. But as we progress further into pregnancy, around month three to four, the placenta is going to take over releasing relaxin on its own. And relaxin is going to provide a number of different roles. First, it's going to increase the flexibility of the symphysis pubis. And that's in order to prepare for birth and allow the, the symphysis pubis to be more flexible for as the fetus is going to pass through the birth canal. The second role of relaxin is going to occur during the birthing process. And what relaxin is going to do is allow for dilation of the uterine cervix. So when we talk about dilation and 10 centimeters dilation in order to allow the fetus to pass through the birth, can birth canal, relaxin is playing a large role in dilating the uterine cervix and allowing for safe passage of the fetus. The next hormone that we're going to talk about is human chorionic somatomamanotropin, or HCS. And you can probably guess from the momanotropin part of the name 
that HCS is going to help support lactation. So one of the core roles of HCS is to prepare the body for lactation. Another key role of HCS is to decrease glucose use. So in order to make sure that the fetus is getting enough glucose, maternal glucose use or sensitivity to insulin goes down, and that allows for blood glucose levels to rise for the fetus to have enough glucose for energy. The final placental hormone that we're going to talk about is corticotropin releasing hormone or CRH. And CRH is going to play a couple of important roles in pregnancy. The first is that an increase in CRH is going to help establish the timing of the birth. So as we start to see increasing CRH levels, that's what's going to indicate that birth is imminent or it's going to help promote imminent birth. The second is that we see an increase in cortisol. It's important because cortisol plays an important role as a counter-regular hormone. It's going to increase glucose levels for the fetus. So let's recap some of the hormones that we have being released here. So we know around month four, the placenta is fully formed. It's going to take over a hormone secreting role. Two of these hormones are going to be progesterone and estrogen, which are going to help sustain and build the endometrium while also preparing the mammary glands for milk. We're going to see relaxin released, which is going to increase the flexibility of the symphysis pubis and dilate the cervix during birth. We're going to see HCS released, and we know that HCS is going to play an important role in preparing for lactation and also decreasing maternal glucose use in order to allow for uh, increased glucose supply for the fetus. Finally, we're also going to see an increased release in CRH, and we know that CRH release is going to establish the timing of the birth, increase cortisol release, which plays an important counter-regulatory role, which is also going to increase blood glucose levels to supply that fetus with as much glucose as it needs to develop. So we're going to switch gears away from hormone secretion from the placenta and start talking about the other functions of the placenta. And when we say other functions, really these are the important functions that the placenta plays in order to support fetal growth and development. And one of the primary things the placenta does is it allows for the transport of nutrients from maternal circulation to fetal circulation. And this is what's going to allow the fetus to actually grow and develop as it should. One of the other roles the pl placenta is going to play is it allows for a diffusion of oxygen. So as oxygen is entering the mother's blood supply, it is going to diffuse through the placenta to the fetus's blood supply. It's also going to act as the waste filtration system. So we actually have a shunt that moves blood away from the fetal liver, and this is because the placenta is playing the primary role in filtering waste from the fetus. And finally, the placenta is going to function as a protective mechanism. We can think of this similarly to the blood-brain barrier, in which it's going to protect the fetus against microorganisms, things like AIDS, measles, chickenpox, polio, encephalitis. Importantly, the placenta will protect against some drugs, but not all, and generally will not protect against alcohol. Move away from the placenta and start talking about the fetal membranes, or what most would refer to as the amniotic sac. The outermost layer of the fetal membranes is the decidua capsularis. If you remember when we talked about um, implantation, the decidua capsularis is that outermost layer, the encapsulating layer of endometrium in which the blastocyst embedded itself. It's now just grown outwards in order to encapsulate the fetus. The next layer is the chorionic labia, and this layer of the membranes is made up of those cytotrophoblasts, or the trophoblasts that did not form into the syncytiotrophoblasts. Below the chorionic labia, we have the chorionic cavity. This is just a space in between the chorionic labia and the amniotic membrane. The innermost layer is our amniotic membrane, and this is what's separating the basically outside of the uterus from the amniotic cavity. Where the fetus resides, this is our amniotic cavity, and this is going to be where we start to see our amniotic fluid developing. And the amniotic fluid is essentially just made up of fetal secretions. Fluid accumulates fairly rapidly through these secretions, and we see about one liter of fluid filling the amniotic sac at birth. We're now going to move away from our discussion about the fetal membranes to a discussion about the umbilical cord. And more specifically, we're going to talk about the vessels that supply oxygen and nutrients as well as transport wastes through the umbilical cord to the placenta and how this connection between the umbilical cord and placenta to maternal blood supply works. In order to do this, we'll take a cross-section of our umbilical cord and we're specifically looking at here the root of the umbilical cord attaching to the placenta and then we have some maternal blood supply. Specifically, we're going to talk about the fact that we have two arteries, which are depicted here in blue, and one vein, which may be counterintuitive because we would normally expect our arteries to be red and our veins to be blue. 
However, the naming of the vessels here actually relates to the fetal heart. So we're thinking about an artery and vein, we're thinking about a vein being something that returns to the fetus's heart and an artery being something that comes away. So the vein is actually going to supply blood to the heart and then the arteries are what's taking blood away from the fetal heart. So what we have depicted here are the two umbilical arteries and they're going to be carrying deoxygenated blood back to the mom or away from the fetus's heart. This is why they're depicted in blue. So again, these are the umbilical arteries and they're carrying deoxygenated blood away from the fetal heart and this is why they're considered arteries. Next we'll look at the umbilical vein. This vein is depicted here in red because it's carrying oxygenated blood back to the fetus and that's why this is considered the umbilical vein because it's returning blood to the fetal heart and we know that when circulation is returning to a heart we consider those vessels veins. So we have one umbilical vein and two umbilical arteries based on the direction of flow to the fetus's heart. The last thing we're going to talk about is the area of diffusion that's found in the placenta. So we can see here that we have these placental nodules that are going to allow for circulation coming from the umbilical cord to meet but not connect to the maternal circulation. So what's happening here is we have small uh, capillaries that are coming off of the umbilical circulation, so our umbilical vein and arteries, that are entering these nodules. And then we have capillaries that are coming off the maternal circulation that's coming in between these nodules. And the importance of this is that nutrients and oxygen and waste can be filtered because they have to pass through the tight junctions that are found within these nodules. So we take something like oxygen, what we can see is that oxygen is going to travel down the maternal arteries into the placenta and then through these tiny capillaries. As it exits these capillaries, it can enter through these nodules through tight junctions that are preventing waste from getting in and then into the capillaries that are going to lead to the umbilical vein. This will allow this oxygen to then travel through the umbilical vein to the fetal heart. Again, this is coming back to the fetus's heart, which is a lot, making it a vein and diffusing through the fetus's body.